On Tuesday, May 2nd, one of Wall Street's most powerful hedge fund managers personally lost an estimated $6 billion in a single day, when the famous short-selling firm Hindenburg accused him of running a quote, Ponzi-like financial scheme. Despite Carl Icahn's titan status on Wall Street, earned through decades of investment outperformance via activist investing, the report destroyed the market's confidence in the superstar manager. Between the close of trading on Monday, May 1st, right before the Hindenburg report, and the close of trading two days later on Wednesday, May 3rd, the price of Icon's publicly traded investment company, Icon Enterprises LP, lost over 35% of its value. This company is majority owned by Carl Icon, and he along with his son own about 85% of its shares. It also represents a majority of his net worth. At the time of writing this video, the mark-to-market -market losses on his stake in Icon Enterprises alone was over $3 billion. Add on top of that billions more loss on the billionaire's margin loan collateralized with those shares. Though the specific details of the loan are private to Mr. Icon, various news outlets reported that Icon personally lost a total of up to $10 billion as a result of the tanking share price. And now, even the feds are getting involved. So how did truly one of the richest, most powerful, and most respected figures on Wall Street have his reputation and credibility shattered in such a short period of time? In this video, we'll explain why Hindenburg almost compared Carl Icahn to a Ponzi schemer, and uncover whether or not Icahn has been riding high on a Wall Street reputation built on a house of cards. Keep in mind that everything in this video is only allegations from Hindenburg. Carl Icahn, his company, and his associates are entitled to the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, and we can make no guarantee of the accuracy of any of these allegations. The fact that Icon Enterprises can lose more than a third of its value overnight, despite being backed by one of Wall Street's biggest superstars, shows how risky it can be to invest in single stocks. Because of this, many investors turn to broad-based index ETFs with hundreds of holdings. The problem is, if you invest in a market ETF such as the S&P 500, by definition you get average market returns. Today's sponsor Gainey.app has a novel solution to this dilemma. It's called Thematic Trading Fractionals, or TTFs. TTFs are model portfolios made by financial experts around a topic or cause. Instead of hundreds of stocks in ETFs, TTFs usually consist of the 10 to 20 best ones in the field, which provides enough diversification and focus. They have over 70 TTFs to choose from, and you can see the track record of each TTF over one or five year time horizon. My personal favorite is the Inflation Proof TTF, which provides 25 stocks that Ganey believes will have the pricing power to protect their profit margins during these times of high inflation. While Ganey creates the TTFs and rebalances the stocks for you, it is not a fund so your investments and money stay in your own account. Your funds are insured for up to $500,000 and up to $250,000 in cash through the SIPC and FDIC. Please note that the insurance does not cover market losses though, so if you're ready to start investing smarter, check out the Ganey app by clicking the link in the description below. To get an accurate sense of what Hindenburg's allegations are, we first have to understand a little bit about what Carl Icahn does. An 87-year-old activist investor, Icahn lived most of his life in New York City. After graduating from Princeton in 1957, he built an incredibly successful career on Wall Street, first as a stockbroker, then as an activist investor and corporate raider. He is a living rags-to-riches story on the largest scale imaginable. Both of his parents were school teachers, but he eventually built one of the largest personal fortunes on the planet. In 2021, Forbes ranked him as the third richest hedge fund manager in the world, behind only Jim Simons and Ray Dalio. Just a few days ago, Bloomberg pegged his net worth at $25 billion. He made his money over the decades by purchasing large stakes in companies, sometimes majority stakes, and then either forcing change to increase shareholder value or splitting up the company's assets. In the 80s, he made the hostile takeover famous with some high-profile investments. One of his most famous episodes was his purchase of Transworld Airlines in the mid-80s, at the time one of the biggest airlines in the world. In 1988, he took the company private in a leveraged buyout. The buyout was highly accretive for Icon, but saddled the company with over half a billion dollars of debt that it couldn't afford. Icon then sold the rights to several of the company's most valuable assets, its transatlantic routes to London, to American Airlines, which made Icon almost half a billion dollars in cash. However, with some of its most lucrative routes gone, Transworld Airlines struggled and filed for bankruptcy a few years later. When it emerged from bankruptcy, Icon had lost control of the company, but he was still able to arrange what would become known as the Karabu Arrangement. This arrangement gave Icon the right to buy plane tickets from Transworld at around half price. He wasn't allowed to resell them through an outside travel agency, but he instead established his own travel agency called LoisFair.com. Obviously, the Karabu arrangement was highly accretive for Icon and his new company. 
but selling tickets at 55 cents on the dollar was obviously terrible business for Trans World, and it cost the company about $100 million per year. The company permanently died just a few years after. Icon has since been involved in countless other activist campaigns and has built one of the most impressive track records on Wall Street. Due to the nature of his style of making money, his campaigns are often very public and sometimes highly controversial. His notoriety among the investing public has made him a favorite of retail investors. He was able to capitalize on this even further by taking his company public, but that would prove to be a double-edged sword. On May 2nd, the famed short-selling research firm Hindenburg Research released a damning report accusing Icon's company of running a Ponzi-like economic structure. In the report, Hindenburg said, quote, Icon has been using money taken in from new investors to pay out dividends to old investors. Such Ponzi-like economic structures are sustainable only to the extent that new money is willing to risk being the last one holding the bag." Unquote. Hindenburg rose to fame in 2020 when they exposed Nikola as a fraud, including by exposing them using a video of one of their trucks rolling down a hill as promotional footage of their hydrogen-powered vehicles. Their report directly led to SEC and Department of Justice investigations that eventually led to a jury finding the former billionaire founder and CEO Trevor Milton guilty. Hindenburg also went after Clover Health, one of Chamath Palihapitiya SPACs at the height of the 2021 SPAC craze, contributing to the stock losing over 90% of its value and the eventual popping of the entire SPAC bubble. From these and several other high-profile short reports, Hindenburg has built a solid reputation on Wall Street. So when they went after Carl Icahn in their latest report, even though Icon has been around for decades, people listened. The crux of the report revolves around what Hindenburg describes as Icon using a confusing economic structure and some clever financial accounting to inflate the value of his own assets. How it works is as follows. Carl Icon's company, IEP, has billions of dollars with which it invests in various activist campaigns and other investments. Most of this money is Carl Icon's, as he and his son own roughly 85% of it but the remaining 15% is publicly traded, meaning that people who admire Icon's track record, especially retail investors, are lured in to invest in the same company that Icon invests his own money through. This gives Icon several benefits, but one of the biggest is that if IAP trades at a high stock price, then that makes Icon's own net worth on paper go up. And when your on-paper net worth goes up, that gives you all sorts of real benefits, such as being able to take out margin loans with IEP shares as collateral. And that's exactly what Icon did. The only problem with this is that the stock price of IEP must remain elevated to maintain Icon's net worth and margin requirements. If IEP has a few bad years in the stock market, that can be a big problem. And that's exactly what's happened in the past seven years. Analysis from the Financial Times found that Icon started putting on billions of dollars of short bets around 2017, hoping to benefit from a market crash that never really happened. These short bets lost $1.8 billion in 2017 as the S&P 500 rallied over 20%. Over the course of the next six years, the short bets continued to sustain losses, bringing the total losses to an estimated $9 billion according to the FT. And these losses are where the Hindenburg allegations come in. According to Hindenburg, Icon protected the stock price of IAP in the face of these massive losses through several tactics. The first was to take advantage of IAP's large retail investor base and offer a huge dividend yield, 15.8% before the recent crash. That's significantly greater than any other US-based large-cap company, and has actually been increased three times since 2015. When a company offers a large dividend that is stable or even increasing, that's perceived as an indication that the company is doing well, and investors will get paid every quarter with a nice big dividend. But if IEP was actually sustaining massive losses, how could they afford to pay this huge dividend? It all goes back to the fact that only 15% of IEP is publicly traded. Icon himself elects to take the dividend on his shares in the form of stock, meaning that IEP only actually has to have 15% of the cash to pay the massive dividend yield. In reality, the company's cash flow comes nowhere near being able to pay the dividend if Icon did not do this, as the cash flow has actually been negative in recent years. In fact, if the dividend were paid out in cash to all shareholders, it would take more than half of the reported net asset value of IEP just to pay the dividend for one year. But IEP did have to pay a relatively large amount of dividends on the 15% of shares that are publicly held. So where did they get that cash from? According to Hindenburg, they got this cash by running a quote, Ponzi-like economic structure, unquote. They have used regular open market sales of IEP shares via at-the-market offerings to raise $1.7 billion over the past four years, taking advantage of their high stock market valuation to raise cash. 
In essence, that equates to taking money from new investors who were lured in by the high dividend yield of IEP and using their investment to pay the dividends of existing investors. But just having a high dividend yield wasn't enough. Most investors are smart enough to see if a company is paying too high of a dividend that it can't support with their business operations. So according to Hindenburg, Icon also took measures to inflate the net asset value of IEP. Net asset value is the sum of the value of all the company's investments in assets, minus any debt. They would report high values for some of their investments that are in reality probably worth much less. For example, they owned 90% of a publicly traded meatpacking company, which they valued at $243 million. At the same time, the market cap of that same company was only about one third of that, or $89 million. One of the reasons that IEP gives for these dramatic markups in value is that because some of their investments are illiquid and thinly traded, the market price is not a valid representation of their true value. Most of the time, illiquidity makes an asset less attractive because the investor has less optionality to buy or sell the asset. In the meatpacking company example, they also bought over a million shares of that company within weeks of writing up the value of those shares by almost 200%. Through this and other similar examples, Hindenburg estimates that the net asset value of IEP has been overreported by a whopping 22%. This obfuscates the fact that IEP is generating huge losses and cannot mathematically support its dividend yield. But it doesn't even end there. IEP also benefits from favorable coverage from Wall Street Research. Jefferies is a large investment bank that engages in equity research, where they publish analysis and recommendations to buy or sell securities to investors. They've maintained a buy rating on IEP, even citing a worst case scenario in which the dividend is still safe in perpetuity. At the same time, Jefferies also has done all of IEP's $1.7 billion of at the market stock offerings. This is a huge potential conflict of interest, as the success of a stock offering is directly related to how much investor interest there is in the company who is selling the stock. This is a case of a Wall Street bank on the one hand telling investors to buy a stock because it's large and safe dividend, and on the other hand being the one profiting from the sale of those shares. Meanwhile, other investment banks such as UBS have stopped coverage of IEP due to a lack of transparency with regard to the valuations of the company's assets. The end result of this is that IEP has enjoyed a stock price way higher relative to its underlying business health than other similar stocks. There are numerous other stocks that allow investors to invest in a portfolio managed by star fund managers, including ones run by Bill Ackman and Third Point's Dan Loeb. These kinds of funds almost always trade at or slightly under NAV, but IEP trades at a 218% premium. This high stock price is sustainable despite the high dividend, because only 15% of the shares are actually required to pay a cash dividend, and IEP is able to sell additional shares to fund those payments. Carl Icahn has reportedly put up over half of his IEP shares as collateral for margin loans, likely to fund his other investments or a lavish lifestyle. Now that the stock price has crashed, the value of his collateral has plummeted, and he has likely lost additional billions of dollars in a margin call-like situation. Even worse for him, the Department of Justice is now getting involved. On May 3rd, the day after the Hindenburg report was released, federal agents issued him an information request. An information request is not a formal allegation, but signals that it wants to review IEP's corporate governance, securities offerings, dividends, and due diligence. Depending on what they find, they could make official allegations, and depending on the severity of the situation, it could potentially mean jail time for Wall Street's third richest billionaire. It's been a historically bad month for a historically great Wall Street titan. In a single day, his entire empire pretty much crumbled beneath his feet, at the hands of an upstart short-selling firm implying that he is running something like a Ponzi scheme. But it didn't happen overnight. For years, Icon has been betting big on an impending market crash, a crash which he kind of got in 2020 and to some extent in 2022, but largely failed. Instead of changing course, he doubled down by taking on leverage in the face of his losses. It's a harrowing story that everyone can learn something from. No matter how good of a strategy you think you have, no matter what the market setup or how bulletproof your due diligence is, and no matter how good of a track record you may have, no one is above the market. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this video. What do you think about Carl Icahn? Do you think his company should be considered a Ponzi scheme? Let us know in the comments section below. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.